This is a poetry burst video for My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. First, let us read the poem. That's My Last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece of wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands work busily a day, and there she stands. Well, please you sit and look at her. I said Fra Pandolf by design, for I never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none put by the curtain I have drawn for you but I and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, not the first are you to turn and ask thus. So it was not a husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandov chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint much never hoped to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed, she liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. So it was all one, my favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries from a vicious fall broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to say and one and say, just this or that, and you disgust me. Here you miss, or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sure, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands, and then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count, your master's no munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed, as starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune there, taming a seahorse, though a rarity, which clouds of Innsbruck cast in bonds for me. My Last Duchess is a poem about the dangers and the abuse of power. A powerful and jealous duke shows off a painting of his wife to a visitor. It seems she's not around anymore, and the duke takes pride in owning her as if she is a possession. Crucially, it's important to remember that My Last Duchess is not boring, difficult, or any of the other things that seem to make you do a massive sigh when it appears. Do not be put off by the length. Use this video to pick out the important bits that you need. To understand the poem, focus on the narrative first, because there's not actually a lot going on. It's just two men looking at a painting. In the first section, a powerful duke is showing off his art collection to a visitor. He tells a visitor to stop and look at a painting of his wife. At the start, there is an obvious sense of menace and threat established. The next part revolves around Fra Pandolf, who is simply the artist who has painted the portrait. Look how the enjambment mirrors the Duke's chaotic mindset. The words die and throat stand out, seemingly out of place, reinforcing that menacing tone. This little chunk focuses on the reasons for the Duke's behaviour. Her looks went everywhere. These lines politely imply that the Duchess was a flirt and the Duke did not take kindly to this. The only bits that you might like from this massive chunk is the bit about the gift of a 900 years old name. His pride is hurt as she seems to treat him like everyone else, despite the fact that he is a duke. He chose never to stoop, which seems to reinforce the idea that he thought that she was socially beneath him. This part is the main bit of threat and menace, where he exerts his power. His tone remains polite, but the euphemism, all smiles stops, seems to imply that he's ruthlessly dealt with her flirtatious behaviour, reinforced by the repetition of as if she were alive. It seems that if he couldn't have her, then no one could. The final part of the poem moves on to the rest of the Duke's collection, namely the sculpture of Neptune. It emphasises how the Duchess is now his possession. He also seems to suggest that he is on the lookout for his next Duchess. 
in summary, this poem is about power and how it can be corrupting and dangerous in the wrong hands. It focuses on a duke, his duchess, and how his pride and jealousy has ruined their relationship. He appears to have had her murdered due to her flirtatious behaviour. Browning wrote the poem in 1842 amidst a fascination with the Italian Renaissance, which was between the 14th and 16th centuries. Ferrara, mentioned at the start of the poem, is a region of Italy. The Duke of Ferrara's wife, Lucrezia, died in suspicious circumstances in 1561. This could have inspired Browning's poem. The poem itself is written in iambic pentameter, which could emphasise the Duke's attempts to seem controlled and ordered. This is reinforced by the use of rhyming couplets. However, this is undercut by Browning's use of enjambment throughout the poem to mirror the Duke's madness. The structural techniques combine to portray a character that on the surface seems in control, grasping for it, but underneath has in fact succumbed to his insatiable lust for power. Browning allows us to read between the lines and pick up on the Duke's subtle hints, suggesting that power's corruption is often hidden. Our first quotation is My Last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. Here, we focus on the portrait. The Duke keeps it behind a curtain, emphasising his control over her. We have the possessive pronoun my, the adjective last, the verb painted, the verb looking, the adjective alive, and we have a caesura. The possessive pronoun my has connotations of ownership. It highlights the Duke's objectification of his Duchess. The adjective last implies that he has acted like this previously and will do it again. She is one of many Duchesses. Here, the verb painted has connotations of blood. It creates a violent and gruesome image of the possible ways in which the Duchess was killed. The verb looking emphasises how he now controls where her looks go and how she behaves towards other people. The adjective alive juxtaposes with the idea of death hinting at her fate. The caesura offers a chance to pause and reflect on what the Duke is saying, reading between the lines of his pleasant tone. Our next quotation is, will please you sit and look at her? This quotation focuses on imperative verbs, which you will know from Macbeth. Imperative verbs are instructions and always linked to power and control. We have the adverb, please, we have the pronoun, you, the imperative verbs, sit and look, and the entire quotation is a rhetorical question. The adverb, please, has connotations of manners and politeness. It is used to create the Duke's facade of civility and innocence. The pronoun, you, seems to implicate the visitor and the reader. We feel a sense of threat as he directs his words towards us. The imperative verbs sit and look of connotations of control and authority. They undercut the Duke's polite tone and hint at a commanding, controlling manner. The verb look is almost ironic. He hated the looks between her and other men, but now that he's in control of it, he's happy for men to look at her. The use of a rhetorical question reinforces the building sense of intimidation. Our next quotation is this grew, I gave commands, and then all smiles stopped together. This quotation acts as a euphemism for the apparent murder that he's committed, or, to be more specific, commanded someone else to commit for him. It is a ruthless, arrogant display of power. We have semicolons used as sejuras. We have the imperative verb, gave. We have the noun, commands, and then we have use of sibilants, the repeated S sounds, and plosive sounds, P and T. The use of semicolons act as jarring sejuras, creating fractured syntax. This allows the Duke to simply convey the idea of action and consequence. She flirted, he dealt with it, it stopped. This creates an uncomfortable, harsh tone, reinforcing the power which his title gives him. The imperative verb gave emphasises how he and he alone is responsible for her death and that he's almost proud of it. 
The noun commands is presumably a euphemism for him demanding that she be killed. He has to maintain his composed image. The sibilant and plosive sounds combine to create a cold, cynical, biting tone. Browning highlights the dangers of absolute power and how it can have drastic consequences in the wrong hands. <laughs> 